Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today I have a special treat. Today I'm going to be talking about the John Dies at the End movie. Someday you will face the unimaginable. It is physically impossible to avoid it. Stuff this sauce. You can see things you shouldn't be able to. If I show you what's in this container, you'll never feel at one with the human race. I realized all at once my one chance to save the universe lay inside this bottle. It'd be opening doors to our world's mind. What is that stuff, John? The soy sauce? That stuff. I'm remembering things that haven't happened yet. We were chosen by the soy sauce. So you guys are what? Some kind of spiritualist exorcists? Something like that. The director of Phantasm and Bubba Hotel. I suppose you are wondering where you are. I'm gonna guess we're in an alternate universe of some kind. <laughs> Warns you to brandish your weapons. Uh, can I buy you a beer? Lock your doors. What the? That's the axe that slayed me. And stay away. Ooh. From red meat. you're wondering why I'm here. I suppose you're wondering what I'm doing with this can of gasoline. John! 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 John dies at the end. Dave, this is John. Where are you right now? Where are you? Heaven? Is there any way that you can steal my body? What? Yep, that's right. John Dies at the End movie, you know. I read the book and I loved it. I already talked about it a while back. Gave it a 5 out of 5, if I recall correctly. And so when I heard that there was going to be a movie count coming out, and that it was made by the same guy who I paraphrased, you know, the last time, you know, Don Coscarelli, the guy who said it was like a combination of uh, Douglas Adams and Stephen King, I knew it was going to be good, and of course when I saw the movie, I was completely right. I'd even, in fact, I'd even go as far as to saying that this is my favorite movie of 2013, and yes, as I am shooting this review, I have in fact seen the movies like Pacific Rim and Riddick, and this is still my favorite. <clears throat> you know, it's just great all around. You know, my uh, all of the acting was great. I'd have to say that, and all the characters were just fantastic, you know. I'd have to say that my favorite character would be Dr. Marconi, you know. <clears throat> How can I say, but uh, you got to give major props to a guy that can kill monsters over the cell, over the phone. So we meet again, Marconi. You find a... there's the director that I already mentioned who and um, who's already directed other great movie other fun great movies uh, Phantasm Bubba Hotep and the Beastmaster as I, if I recall correctly and um, <clears throat> yeah it was just uh, great overall he did a great job everyone did a great job you know with all the the 
practical effects with the meat monster that you just saw. There was uh, some questionable stuff like the CG for the Korok was not, a, it's kind of, if you, and, uh, <clears throat> and I'm pretty sure the, how the Ripper is not actually how you would disperse chemical weapons or whatever. But overall, it was just a fantastic, you know, overall film. And to the direct, for the director, I can say is that, you know, if you can make this guy look intimidating, Yo, what up, five then you're clearly, you definitely know what you're doing, you know. <clears throat> It's a fantastic movie. It's, uh, of course, based on a fantastic book. And it's just great humor, great everything. And um, also, uh, I should probably say it is that this is a very rated R film. It's got, uh, you know, topless women, people getting their heads blown up with shotguns and random doorknob penis, so... You know, keep the kids out while you're watching this, or cover no when to cover, or watch it ahead of time to know when to cover their eyes, and so forth. Anyway, uh, one thing that I was also really excited to learn is that roughly around the same time that I heard that there was going to be a movie coming out, I also ran, I also came across the sequel. This book is full of spiders. You know how sometimes when you're drifting off to sleep you feel that jolt? Like you were falling and caught yourself at the last second? It's nothing to be concerned about. It's usually just a parasite adjusting its grip. I guess I should explain that a little further. There exists in this world a spider the size of a dinner plate. A foot wide if you include the legs. It's called the Goliath bird-eating spider. I bring this up because the Goliath was the first thing that popped into my mind when I woke up with something in my bed, biting my leg. My name's David Wong, by the way. It's on the cover. If you don't know who I am, that's perfect. That means you didn't read the previous book in this saga, which, to be frank, doesn't paint me in the best light. I'm pleased to have this fresh opportunity to try to convince you I'm not. Gross. And yes, you did just seriously see a trailer for a book. That's how epic this book is. That's how good it is. Warning, you may have a huge invisible spider living in your skull. This is not a metaphor. You will dismiss this as ridiculous fear-mongering. Ridiculous... Dismissing things as ridiculous fear-mongering is, in fact, the first symptom of parasitic spider infection. The creature secretes a chemical into the brain to stimulate skepticism in order to prevent you from seeking the cure. That's just as well, since the cure involves learning what a chainsaw tastes like. You, can, you can't feel the spider because it controls your nerve endings. You can't see it because it decides what you see. Also, it controls your nerve endings, and that's part of our eyes are part of your nerves. You won't even feel it when it breathes, and it will breed. So, what happens when your family, friends, and neighbors get mind controlling skull spiders? We're all about to find out. Just stay calm and remember that telling you about the spider situation is not the same as having caused it. Even, <clears throat> I'm just the messenger, even if I did sort of cause it. Well, so much for his, the trailer where he tries to tell you, oh, this is my chance to, you know, tell you that I'm not a shithead, or prove, I mean, prove to you that I'm not a shithead. Either way, I will hold it against you. I know that's just the spider talking. Anyway, uh... Like the last book that I talked about, <clears throat> this book is a great blend of dark humor, and I just love it, you know. <clears throat> you know, just like, the, it, it actually just starts out, but really it, uh, I mean, it starts out, you know, with all sorts of funny humor, though I should say, and, um, 
Uh, it uh, basically becomes and like it it's like how most sequels are, you know, where it just amps up the scale, everything's bigger. This time around it involves the entire town that John and Dave live in, which they decided to call undisclosed for so that way to not attract tourists who will come in and you know, maybe get infected with killer spiders or whatever. Anyway, um, it's definitely much, like I said, everything is much grander, you know, much darker, not funnier, but still okay. And, um, you know, it really, like, um, they do a good job at emphasizing how um, hopeless that uh, their situation is, and it really makes everything feel much bleaker than the last book. But overall, it's still fantastic. The movie, my personal rating of 5 out of 5, and the book, the same. They're both great, highly recommended, loved them both, yeah. Anyway, until next time, we're going to be getting a little political up in this here YouTube biatch with the Norwellian classic. Until then, see you later. Keep it fruity. That's my new catchphrase. Don't wear it out. Or do... Or whatever. Eh. Anyway, see ya.